Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Carroll. And I'm sure that you've all heard the excitement, the worries, the news overall over the last few years about gene editing, the possibility of editing human genes at a very detailed level, not to mention plant and animal genes, of course. Today's guest, Fyodor Urnov, is actually not just one of the world's experts. He coined the term gene editing, and he's been active in the field since the beginning, so he knows what he's talking about. And I know that as well as prospects for curing diseases and stuff like that, there are worries about, you know, it would be good to cure diseases using gene editing, but what if someone made super soldiers and they became bad like the Red Skull instead of good like Captain America? Wouldn't that be bad? So at the end of the, this interview, I asked Fyodor, I said, you know, as responsible as we might want to be as scientists, as countries, as international regulatory agencies— isn't it coming to the point where this is almost too easy and almost anyone will be able to do gene editing and make designer babies in their basements or their bedrooms, as it were? And his answer was a little bit surprising. He said, absolutely, it's going to happen. Uh, and that's a little bit of a wake-up call. You know, it is kind of easy to play around with the human genome. And we're going to have to deal with that in one way or the other. This, All this stuff came about over just the last 10 years or even five years uh, with a wonderful little gizmo called CRISPR-Cas, which you've probably heard about, CRISPR-Cas9. Uh, Jennifer Doudna, Emmanuel Charpentier, and other researchers figured out how to basically borrow a mechanism that had already been invented by biology, right? This is something that exists in bacteria in order to fight off viruses. So the CRISPR-Cas9 system can recognize a bad virus and then go in and attack and neutralize it. And the way that it neutralizes it is by snipping its DNA and either just tearing it apart or by inserting something to make it not so bad. So the human beings realized, oh my goodness, bacteria have already figured out how to do this. We can use their technology and adapt it to our own needs. So it's no doubt that we are at the beginning, the very dawn of the gene editing era. There's no doubt this will be very, very good for a lot of reasons. There's no doubt this is going to be scary and new for a lot of reasons. So I thought it'd be a lot of fun to talk to someone who's been there before the CRISPR-Cas9 revolution and is still there working at the front lines on both what gene editing is, how it works, and what it's going to mean for us in the years to come. So this is a great conversation with Fyodor Ornov. Let me just quickly mention also before we start that... This podcast is being released the day before the paperback release of my book, Something Deeply Hidden. So if any of you out there are on the one hand paperback book readers, and on the other hand not yet enthusiastic enough to have purchased the hard copy, the hardback version rather, of, uh, it's still a hard copy if you get the paperback version, the hardback version of Something Deeply Hidden, and you want to know about quantum mechanics, many worlds, and some of the interesting ideas going on in physics with emergent space time and stuff like that, be sure to rush out to your local or virtual bookstore and pick up a copy of Something Deeply Hidden. I will appreciate it. The universe will appreciate it. And with that, let's go. Peter Ornov, welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. Thank you for having me. I'll actually give you a special welcome because uh, I've noticed that in the past few months, it's not been easy to get biologists, especially molecular slash cell biologists, onto the show. They're, they're somehow, uh, their attention is being absorbed by something else, by this weird virus that is sweeping the world. So uh, are you one of these people whose attention has been diverted from your regular work, or have you sort of stubbornly pressed forward with your basic research, even in the middle of the pandemic? I have been swept away by a tsunami <laughs> known as the pandemic. And as I look around my professional life, none of the objects so familiar to me, which is my beloved CRISPR-Cas, which is the, the protein that we use to genet do genetic engineering, um, and the, the human cells that I do genetic engineering on, whether they happen to be blood stem cells or lung cells, uh, or brain cells, none of them are, are around me. Mm. Instead, I'm surrounded by uh, snot and spit. There mm. is no way to say it except to say it, because those are the two types of specimens, or as physicians say, clinical matrices, that 
we use to test individuals for virus. And in fact, for the past four and a half months, I'd say 99.73% of my life has been devoted to that. And productively so? Do you think that the uh, the skill set that you had coming in has been uh, well calibrated for the challenges of this? You know, if you'd asked me 35 years ago when I first uh, walked into a freshman year biology class, would there ever be a chance that the types of things you're going to learn would have a, a real world impact on clinical care? I'd say probably not, because yeah. as many of my peers, I signed up to be a research scientist in biology because I love the natural world. I think living systems are the most amazing thing out there. Although I suspect as a physicist, you, you might politely disagree. But, we're, uh, we're ecumenical here I, at the Mindscape uh, podcast. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought I would spend the entirety of my life in the beautiful ivory tower of academia, studying fondly my esoteric basic science question. The, what happened was one divided by that. Um, 20 years ago, I had the good fortune of joining a biotech where I then spent 15 years developing ways to genetically engineer people to treat disease, which is not exactly ivory tower. Mm. And then two years ago, when I joined the, the faculty here at Berkeley, uh, I did so to continue that work on, on trying to use genetic engineering to treat disease. And then, of course, the pandemic hit. And it's kind of amazing to me that... The, the, the central tool that the nation and the world needs so desperately to deal with the pandemic, which is testing, do yeah. you or do you not have the virus? That the mechanics under the hood of what it takes to answer that question are actually taught to every single PhD in my field, which is molecular and cell biology, in the first month of them joining the lab. Um, and again, if you if you walk around here at Berkeley and ask the first year graduate student, uh, do you think that whatever you're learning will be used for clinical care? Not many of them will say, oh, absolutely. But it happens to be the case that the elementary skill sets of testing for the virus are the same elementary skill sets that I learned, oh my goodness, in late September 1990, when I was a first year <laughs> graduate student at Brown. Yeah. And uh, it seems literally, it's literally in the last century. Uh, and yet, the, the fundamental mechanics of how one diagnoses an individual to have the virus rely on, I guess, decades-old techniques, which are tried and true. Oh, that's actually good to know. I mean, I, I, it makes me think that if ever the world comes into a state where my skill set is called upon to help in some tangible way, we're in really big trouble, much bigger trouble <laughs> even than we are now. So glad to hear that the um, biologists. I, I, I am just visualizing this gathering of some uh, legislative body uh, that says, <laughs> yes, at this point, we need a cohort of theoretical physicists oh, no, to help yes. us deal with this. It did happen in the I mean, Manhattan I, I, Project, I, but it's different now. Yeah. I, 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 by the way, of course, I'm joking. One of one of the truly remarkable things about what you do and what I do is the relevance and the resonance is unpredictable. Like, yeah. I think most, most people don't know that the GPS on their phones uh, works on Einstein's uh, theory of relativity, right? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And just, but, but I mean, no, I, I swear you that to you that the majority of people who use that just don't don't who use GPS just don't think about that. Similarly, I think most people who get diagnosed, who get tested for the virus, they don't really think about the mechanics. Mm -hmm. And the fact that the, the mechanics of the testing have to do with really foundational tools of my field, which is molecular biology that have been developed over the past 50 years, right, is just not something that's in the headlines daily. And yet here we are, basic biologists used to sitting in our with our test tubes in our cells in isolation of a laboratory, um, finding ourselves in the in the in the minds of the public. Like I, I I say to people, oh, you know, RNA extraction, and lay people ask me, oh, do you do that qPCR thing, or do you do something else? And I go, well, uh -oh. I never thought that the word qPCR would be used, which stands for quantitative polymerase chain reaction, by the way, uh, would be ever would ever emerge in a layperson conversation. And yet here we are. 
Well, this is a good segue because what I what I actually want to do is get into CRISPR and gene editing, and then we can see if that circles us back to fighting viruses and so forth. So, uh, for uh, we take it that our audience knows what DNA is, that our genetic information is stored in DNA, and also probably most people out there have this feeling that there's been this revolution in the past few years uh, in terms of editing the DNA with this CRISPR Cas stuff. So maybe. You can just tell us you're one of the world's experts. What is CRISPR? What does it go around crisping, and uh, what are we going to use it for? Oh my goodness! Uh, you can skip the what are we going to use it for? We'll get there. We'll get there later. What is it? How does it work? Let's put it that way. So, so asking me about CRISPR is a bit like asking a koala what it thinks about eucalyptus leaves. <laughs> I can go on and on and on. The reason that we coined the term gene editing as an umbrella phrase to describe ways of precise genetic engineering is by e explicit analogy to word processing. Uh -huh. Both CRISPR and the technologies that preceded it, which accomplished the same thing, do to the human genetic code, or as it happens, to the genetic code of a cow, or to the genetic code code of a maize plant. And I, I use these three examples deliberately because these are living things that have been genetically edited or CRISPRed. Uh, this technique does to the DNA of a corn plant, a cow, or a human precisely what your favorite word processor would do to text. You open um, a, 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 a narrative, a document on your computer screen, you use your mouse to click on a bit of text, and then you type on your keyboard whatever desired edit uh, you wish. And so I'm delighted that this term gene editing that my colleagues and I came up with 15 years ago is universally adopted. And in fact, people talk about gene, edit, gene edited organisms, or we introduce this edit into a human cell precisely in the way that people describe uh, introducing an edit into a document. Mm. That was our explicit goal, and I guess we succeeded. But I think that maybe people take that analogy too literally. Uh, you know, they have the idea that you're just laying out the DNA on a slab and then you go and copy and paste yeah. something like that. I mean, the, the messy biology of it is a bit more uh, intricate. Um, that would be the understatement of the year. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think what was Einstein's favorite phrase, everything should be made as simple as possible, but not necessarily simpler. Yes. So in, 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 in telling you how gene editing broadly and how CRISPR specifically works, I really need to carefully walk that line to not in, not in, not oversimplify. Mm -hmm. um, I think a good place to start is by saying the following. Human DNA is very long. Uh, you know, your audience is doubtless familiar with the number 6.6 .6 times 10 to the ninth letters of genetic code is what it takes to build a human being. Now, a, a good way to think about how long that is, is as follows. If you read the genetic code one letter at a time, A, C, T, G, one, one second at a time, mm -hmm. it'll take you a century to, to read the entire human genome. So first, the human genome is very long. This is also true of the cow, and this is also true for corn. Second, um, with the exception of microbes, like really small things that move around and leave their little independent lives, most living systems don't like their DNA changed in any way at all. And this is because DNA is, you know, essentially the, the, the storage document for who, who they are. Yeah. And Mother Nature protects the integrity of the genetic material. So, and you, you can see how extraordinary this repair machinery is if you look at folks who have um, the misfortune of not having the machinery to repair damage. So, mm. for example, there are folks with rare diseases who cannot tolerate sunlight because um, they don't have the, the right machinery to fix damage to the DNA. And they need to wear, you know, sunscreen SPF 10,000. Right. And in fact, they sell, they near never venture out into the daylight. Uh, they have to basically be active at night. So not only does our, does our DNA refuse to be changed, um, our DNA has a large number of molecular machines that literally babysit it. And if something damages it, and 
what are kind what are the kinds of things that damage DNA? So I mentioned sunlight. So UV rays create a particular kind of damage. Uh, chemicals can damage can damage DNA. So for example, you know the reason smoking causes cancer is it has a chemical which physically damages the DNA and through the repair machinery doesn't get to it in time, and you get you get genetic changes that cause cancer. Um, the the other type of damage that our DNA gets all the time. And this is the most interesting one for people who want to understand how gene editing works, is, is actually the most drastic one, which is literally taking scissors and cutting the familiar double-stranded helix into two. So if you think about the two, the two individual strands of DNA winding around each other in that beautiful double helix, um, now imagine taking scissors and literally cutting that thing so that you have now where you had two double helices, helices uh, one double helix, you now have two. Mm -hmm. So this is a type of damage that occurs um, spontaneously, just human cells just going about their business. Sometimes the DNA just breaks. Um, humans most often experience it, in fact, at the doctor's office. So when you get a chest X-ray, I guess I suppose an assay that's really important right now, given the pandemic, or when you go to the dentist to get a dental X-ray, um, the, uh, the, the rays hit your DNA and your DNA, I don't want to make your audience squirm with fear <laughs> next time they're in the dentist chair, uh, other than for anticipation for the of whatever. Reasons, the dentist, yeah. other than, there are no, we don't need additional reasons to not want right. to go to the dentist. Uh, but the bottom line is that the, 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 the x-rays that are used to take a picture of your teeth and of your mouth damage the DNA uh, Every, every bit of DNA they encounter by, by basically cutting it. And the reason this, this, this break is so dangerous is we've all learned about chromosomes. We have uh, 46 of them, 23 pairs, one from mom, one from dad for each one. And we, we've all learned and forgotten in high school about mitosis, this beautiful process where when a cell needs to divide, it makes a copy of all the chromosomes and one copy goes to the cell on the left, one copy goes to the cell on the right. Now, can you imagine if, if, if one of these chromosomes has a break? This means that during cell division, that broken piece will just be left behind. Hmm. And that means losing all the genes that are on that broken off piece. And that, the overwhelming majority of the time, is, genetic, is a genetic loss that human cells cannot tolerate. You can't just get rid of human genes left and right. Now, you can get rid of some, but the notion that there would be a break on one of the chromosomes such that an entire chunk of it just gets lost, that's incompatible with, forget human beings being alive, it's incompatible with human cells being alive. Hmm. But people should still go to the dentist because the reason that x-rays, whether of the chest or of your um, oral cavity or that your exposure to ionizing radiation from the sun when you take um, a commercial flight, again, not many people are flying these days, but back when they used to, um, the, the sun will uh, emit rays and it will hit your DNA and your DNA will be broken into pieces. So mother nature has evolved a machine to rapidly heal the break. And I'll speak more to this machine in a second, except I think it's really important to appreciate how ancient the machine is. You know, life on Earth is, what, 4.5 billion years old, 3.5, you know, yep. whatever the number. Um, the machinery that heals the brakes is one of the oldest molecular machines we know. So to give you to just to give you a representative example, budding yeast, the tiny yeasties that give us uh, bread and wine and beer and humans their machinery for repairing that kind of damage is so similar that biologists who study that repair machinery in human cells use the exact same nomenclature for the bits and pieces of it as the biologists who study yeast. Hmm. And one thing uh, your audience may not know about experimental biologists is they would rather use each other's toothbrushes than use each other's nomenclature. <laughs> So when people who study human biology use the same gene names as the people who study yeast, that is really to acknowledge the majesty of Mother Nature as having evolved something a very long time ago, hundreds and hundreds of million years ago, and um, then preserving it. Okay, so so far we've spent a number of minutes discussing the fact that when our DNA is broken, um, 
well, you know, it just gets fixed. And what does that have to do with genetic engineering? Yeah. So at this point, um, and one of the themes I'd love to return to a couple of times as I share with you and your audience, um, the marvelous thing that's gene editing, is how often in the, let's think about this, 25-year-old scientific history of gene editing, and because that's when gene editing really began. It began in 1994, 1995, in the laboratory of a scientist at Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York named Marie Jason. And she's actually still there and leads the field, and she's absolutely wonderful. And um, in the in the 25 year uh, history of, of developing gene editing as, as a tool, one of the things we've consistently marveled is how many of the discoveries that have given us remarkable recent advances in gene editing. So for example, there was recently a, a person, her name is Victoria Gray, and she was comfortable disclosing publicly that she is a, a a subject, uh, that's a strong word to use, and that's a technical word in the world of clinical trials, to describe a human being who has consented to participate in a, in, a, in a clinical trial of an experimental therapeutic. And so she's the subject on the clinical trial to do gene editing for sickle cell disease, which she has. She got gene edited, I think, about a year ago, and she no longer has sickle cell disease, which is kind of astonishing. So CRISPR, in seven years, went from being, uh, uh, in eight years, I guess, because it's already 2020, time flies, my goodness, in eight years from when Jennifer Doudna here on the Berkeley campus discovered how CRISPR works, we went in just eight years from the discovery to a cure. But Jennifer Doudna's work was focused on fundamental biology. She wasn't trying to build, and she herself widely acknowledges, she was not trying to build a gene editor to treat sickle. She's just a curious scientist fascinated by how mother nature works. Similarly, the beginnings of gene editing emerged out of a fundamental curiosity that people had about how do human cells repair damage. Let me pause for a moment to recommend The Great Courses Plus. This is a streaming service that gives you instant access to a wide variety of high-level courses so that you can learn about things in the privacy of your own home at your convenience. I love the fact that there's such a wide variety of topics being explored from oceanography to history to philosophy to food and wine and music. For example, there's one interesting course I came across on digital media literacy. It's simply called Fighting Misinformation. So it's a great courses level introduction to how to be a smarter consumer of what you read about and find online. The Great Courses Plus is great because it's really convenient. You can watch it on your computer, you can listen to it, it can be on your mobile device, on your TV with your family or what have you. Now is the perfect time to sign up for The Great Courses Plus because Mindscape listeners can get a free trial today if they go to this special URL thegreatcoursesplus.com slash Mindscape. That's T-H-E greatcoursesplus dot com slash Mindscape. And so what emerged, by the way, it's going to get a little bit technical, but you have my word, it's technical of the good kind, where I'm hopeful that at the end of this, of the 60 seconds is going to take me to dive into this rabbit hole of technicality. You will go, oh yeah, okay, that makes sense. We love it. That's why so we're basically, here. Good. So there are basically two ways to repair a broken chromosome. The first one is the most logical one. You just put the DNA back together again. So that pathway is called rather, you know, not creatively, that's called end joining. Again, we could have found a style, a more stylish name, but there you have it. And um, one of the things that's remarkable about it is sometimes when Mother Nature puts the two ends back together again, she loses a letter or two. Why? Well, you know, Mother Nature has reasoned that, quote unquote, only 5% of human DNA is actually coding for genes. Mm. And that means that only 5% of the breaks will happen um, in areas of sort of in areas of the genome that make proteins that make you and I. And thus, you know what? One in 20 is okay. Furthermore, it's not that every time a break happens, Mother Nature makes a mistake. It's just that she makes the mistake some of the time. Mm. And that is one, the first key tool in the gene editor's toolbox is the ability to cut a gene of interest. And the two examples I will give you are ones that actually are in the clinic right now. 
One is to cut a gene that makes humans susceptible to HIV. And the other one is to cut a gene that prevents, this is where it's going to get fun, that prevents the production of a desired form of hemoglobin. And in both cases, you can imagine a setting where if you cut a gene that HIV needs to replicate, or if you cut a gene that prevents the production of a healthy hemoglobin, you could immediately see why that could be potentially clinically useful. Right. You could take a person with HIV, get rid of that gene, and maybe the virus will stop doing what it does. Or you can take a human being with sickle cell disease, somebody who cannot make normal globe hemoglobin, cut that other gene, and you know, Mother Nature will start making a normal hemoglobin. And I wouldn't be dragging you through all of these technicalities if that hadn't been done and if that hadn't actually worked hmm. on living people, not in a, you know, one of those science fiction novels. I, I, I once <laughs> uh, typed the word CRISPR on Amazon by mistake. I was going to search the literature and I was just so ups- um, I was I was trying to buy a book for my kid and I typed CRISPR as a as, as a by Newtonian inertia in the search box. And the first thing that came out on Amazon is, is, is a novel called CRISPR the Apocalypse. Sure. Someone's going to write that book. You know, once it's out there, it's going to happen. Uh, you know, I, I, I recommend against it because the, the tagline goes, uh, a dramatic novel of planetary disaster uh, driven by brilliant scientists and maniacal Russians. I'm, <laughs> I'm not making this up. And so Jennifer Dowd, I jo- told Jennifer Dowd when I saw this that, you know, it goes brilliant scientists as maniacal Russians. I said that between her and I, we have the two positions covered. There you go. <laughs> but so far, we're just so, uh, we're just cutting DNA, right? I mean, my impression is we can insert also. Oh, we're getting straight to that. So, but when the DNA is cut, it doesn't just shred; it comes back together again. But you gain or lose a few letters, and it turns out because of the way genes work, because of the way the genetic code works. If you gain or lose one or two letters in a gene, that actually kills the gene. Now, your readers will, your audience will remember from high school biology that the genetic, the the elementary word of the genetic code is is, is a group of three. Mm-hmm. For example, the word A T G is a word in the genetic code, and it says start. The word TAA in the genetic code is a word, and it says stop. And um, the the letter, the word TTT in the genetic code is a word that says, please insert the amino acid phenylalanine. (laughs) Um, um, And, you know, I'm not going to recite the genetic code because that's a fantastic way to put people to sleep. Um, But that means that if you lose three letters, you're still okay you're still okay because you've just skipped a word and the text still makes sense. For example, you know, to be or not to be, that is question. Whether it is nobler, you know, we just lost the word the, but it's still intelligible. Um, Whereas in genetic text, which is read as a continuous string, if you gain or lose just a letter or two, everything after the mistake is gibberish. Right. Scientists call this a frame shift which means an inability to correctly interpret where the genetic text starts and ends its words. So this ability to break a gene or get rid of a gene by cutting it and then letting Mother Nature's somewhat error-prone end-joining process give you what's called a gene knockout is actually really useful clinically. I mentioned to you this business about HIV and sickle cell disease. It's useful for agriculture. So, for example, the first genetically engineered gene-edited crop that will be marketed in the United States, not GMO. GMOs have been on the market since the 90s. And as your audience knows, more than 90% of corn, cotton, and soybean grown in the United States are actually old-school transgenic GMOs. No, this is a gene-edited crop. And the first gene-edited crop will be corn. It will be waxy corn. It will be used for the production of starch. And it will not be an insertion or a precise repair of mutation. It will be actually such a gene knockout. So that's the story of knockout, ranging from uh, corn that has desired properties for making of starch to human beings being gene edited to deal with their HIV or sickle cell disease. There's one other 
tool in the arm in the armamentarium of a gene editor, and that's the ability to repair mutations, and if you want to be so ambitious, to insert larger stretches of genetic text. So how does that work? Well, I, I, I'm going to have to ask you and, and the audience to step back yet again to the fundamental biology of how Mother Nature deals with these rather dangerous breaks. Right. We talked about the fact that the simplest thing to do is just put the two ends back together again and march on. Mother Nature is concerned, in fact, about precisely the gain or loss of genetic information. So she evolved a separate way to heal the breaks, which is achieves the same effect. The, the break is healed, but how is magnificently different. <laughs> and this is one of those things. Well I, well, I should say that podcasts are one of my favorite things because uh, I can bring them with me wherever I am. Huh? This is one of those where I wish I could magically pop out of your audience's podcast uh, device and start waving my hands in the air because... <laughs> This is one of those picture worth a thousand words kinds of things, but let me do my best. The other way to repair a break is to find an unbroken identical DNA molecule and literally do a control C, control V, right. copy paste the missing genetic information from an unbroken, intact, normal template. Now, where on earth does Mother Nature have an unbroken, intact template? Well, actually, many of your cells currently have such a template. And in, in fact, um, your skin cells, your your bone marrow cells, your the lining of your intestine and your mouth. Um, anytime cells divide, they have to copy the DNA. And therefore, every time Mother Nature copies one of your chromosomes, it makes an identical copy. And I should say, in one of those ways in which geneticists have come up with nomenclature that is the bane of existence of all pre-medical students on planet Earth, is uh, that identical copy of DNA is not called a twin, which would be logical. It's called a sister. <laughs> I can explain why it's one of those terms that really should be retired, but never will. We just have to live with it. Okay. So yes, in all our cells that divide, every piece of DNA is flanked by an identical copy, which unfortunately is called a sister. So Mother Nature evolved this beautiful pathway where if one chromosome is broken, that broken end, literally, it's very sweet. It's, it's actually, it's, it's kind of warm and fuzzy. It, there's this little broken end and it searches it truly performs a search, like waving its little molecular hand around. Can somebody help me? And what's it searching for? It is searching for a molecule, a DNA molecule of identical sequence. And when it finds it, it automatically assumes that it is the sister molecule, that is its kin, it's identical. And Mother Nature then evolved a way to copy paste the information at the break from the sister chromosome into the broken one and heal the heal the break. I know that's a lot to take in. So I'll just recap. One chromosome is broken. The broken end starts to search for something in its molecular neighborhood that is identical in sequence. Typically, it's what's called a sister chromatid, which is identical. It copies the missing information from the sister into itself and life can continue. Yeah. So what in heaven's name does that have to do with gene editing? Much to everyone's surprise, and as discovered by a number of people actually studying little budding yeast, and then this discovery was expanded to human cells, you can fool Mother Nature. Now, you can't fool her all the time, but sometimes you do so and with spectacular results. What you can do is this. Take a chromosome and break it. And we can we can we will speak in a second as to how you actually do that. What, what are those molecular scissors? Normally that break would be either repaired by putting the ends back together, which is fine, not nothing we can do about that. Or alternatively, it will be repaired by trying to reach out to the sister 
and saying, listen, get, lend me a helping hand here. I'd, need, I'd like some missing genetic information. So it was discovered that you can basically stick inside a yeast cell or a human cell a bunch of DNA that is identical in DNA that you have made in the lab. So this is, if this if this is the part where your audience hears the lo the laughter of a maniacal scientist going, you know, <laughs> it is alive. The, 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 this would be a good time to evoke the stereotype. Um, nobody ever said it is alive. In fact, most of us, in fact, all of us who work at the bench are quite quite silent because we focus on mm. what we're doing. Uh, so we don't, you know, rip, rip our lab coats off and run around the streets of Berkeley called, saying Eureka. Um, when you break a chromosome in a, in a precise location and then put inside the cell a piece of DNA that is identical to the broken stretch, but you make a tiny change, you literally change one letter, Mother Nature will not notice and will copy paste that change into the chromosome. It's amazing that this works, but it does, and astonishingly well. So, and I'll just give you some numbers, which are kind of amazing. Um, scientists have performed this process on human blood stem cells. These are the cells that make red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets. So inside your bone marrow, inside, inside the bones, that form your pelvis or in, in, inside the, uh, the, the largest um, bone of your, of, of your um, one of the largest bones in your body, which is, I think, the, the humerus, there's a cavity. And inside the cavity is, is the famous stem cell, which, which makes all the blood, blood, uh, blood stem cells that circle around you and keep you alive. You know, people have shown that you can take a bunch of cells like that and make a break and then provide a a decoy, a Trojan horse, a repair template that places a new piece of genetic information into the chromosome. And literally half the cells politely acquire that new genetic change. Well, sorry, I want to give this you is, this number. This, th this, is, this is important. I want to I sort of dig in on this because this is what is confusing to me. So um, you, we're imagining that this is a potentially grown-up adult organism. And mm -hmm. it's not that you have to go in uh, with a microscope and look at every single one of their cells and edit it. You can insert and edit, and it will spread through at least many of the other cells. Is that right? Yes, and it gets even better. To some extent, we can control how this spreads. Now, I, I want to be clear what it is that is spreading. It is not the case, although that would be kind of amazing, if a genetically edited cell starts to say to its neighbors, guess what? I've been gene edited. Do you want some of my DNA? <laughs> no, that's not what happens. Although that would be kind of astonishing. But by the way, I should say that there are examples in biology like that. Bacteria do that all the time. But human cells normally do not share DNA with each other. Instead, what spreads is the gene editor itself, mm. which as I'm about to explain, is this tiny molecular machine that we engineer in the lab and then we stick it inside the cells, and we, can, we have two ways of doing that. If you want to gene edit an organ, such as the eye or the liver, you actually have to inject the gene editor into the body. Typically, that's done by enveloping the editor in a virus. And this is just before people... Right now, <laughs> saying that you're going to inject people with a virus is yeah. not exactly what to, what to say. You're not going to get big it's bucks asking for that. Right. It's a bit like saying during a plague, would you like some rats? <laughs> no, we do not want more rats. Um, so no, this is a very different virus. It's not SARS-CoV-2. It's innocuous. And furthermore, it's made even more innocuous by gutting it of whatever it had and replacing its insides with the gene editor. So what you basically do for the eye is you inject the virus into the eye and it goes and enters the cells. Or for the liver, you inject the virus directly into the bloodstream. And the virus homes to the liver and infects the liver cells and delivers the gene editor. And both of these things are being done clinically right now for congenital blindness and for hemophilia, respectively. So I'm deliberately not using hypothetical examples. There are gene edited people on the planet who have been treated using this approach. And is the stuff that you're editing into the genes um, stuff that you get from a healthy cell? Or are there gene programmers uh, actually writing the GCTAs in the correct order to get something new? 
Um, the sky is the limit. I can tell you what's happening now and what we'd like to do. So for now, um, the genetic engineering of um, cells, um, organs in, in living humans, so whether you engineer the eye or the liver, and just to give you a sense of what's on the horizon, I think the next um, genetic engineering will be for muscular dystrophy, so it will be the muscle. Mm -hmm. And then people are very excited about applying gene editing to the lung. In all those cases, what's being done is either repair of a mutation that causes disease or the addition of a normal, healthy human gene that corrects the defect in a natural gene. So there is no, quote unquote, genetic augmentation or genetic embellishment. Right. Having said that, and here's, you know, this is where it gets fun. In fact, one of the earliest and biggest success stories, not in gene editing, but in the bigger field of human genetic engineering, was in fact precisely in such genetic augmentation. Now, genetic engineering of people started in 1989. So it started a pretty, pretty, it's pretty remarkable. It's 30 years old. And it started not by precise editing. You know, here's a gene here. Let's fix letter number four. It started by just inserting genes using viruses. And there are many reasons why one can do that, but the most remarkable one that's currently not just widely practiced, but it's in a, there are two approved medicines in that class, is something called cancer immunotherapy. And the basic idea that emerged in the late 90s, early 2000s, was you could cause the body's own immune system to attack the cancer. And the way that's done is you engineer a molecule. This is literally laboratory engineering. You engineer a molecule that will cause your immune system cell to attack the cancer cell. Then you take the immune system cells out, you stick a gene that encodes or specifies the production of, of that new molecule, you put the cells back in, and lo and behold, the cells now rerouted or reprogrammed, I know those are big words, <laughs> reprogrammed. Well, I mean, there is a lot of imagery associated with sure. it. People, yeah. think, people think Gattaca, people think whatever they saw on Instagram, and, you know, one has to be careful with language because, you know, words have meaning. So I, I, I'm always very mindful to not say things like, you know, this is why I think partly why we invented the word gene editing, because we wanted to con contrast it with, you know, good old GMOs, because the, I don't think, right. I, I, I think the damage that has been done by the publicity around uh, GMOs, I, I think is never going to be repaired. I think we're just stuck with that. Um, they're, they're, they're actually safe, but the public will never accept that fact. So, you know, we just have to move on. But the big so, point um, that you seem to be making about the use of gene editing for fighting diseases is in some way you're giving the body the resources that it needs to fight it in a very natural biological way. Correct. So, for example, our, our ability to fight HIV by getting rid of that CCR5 gene, that's the name of the gene, is based on a discovery made here in the San Francisco Bay Area during the, the tragedy of the, uh, of the AIDS pandemic when uh, physicians discovered here um, in San Francisco, actually, that there are folks whose partners had succumbed to AIDS, and these folks reported having unprotected sex with them and yet were virus-free. And when their DNA was studied, they turned out to be naturally lacking that gene. And that told physicians, first of all, that you can lose that gene without any overt symptoms, and second, that if you get rid of that gene, you could potentially protect a person from HIV. So natural genetic variation or transferring genetic variation naturally from one person to another became a therapeutic modality. Similarly, for the sickle cell disease treatment strategy that was used to uh, treat, and uh, as best as we can tell, cure Victoria Gray, there are people who have this natural variant of this gene. It's basically a reduced form, a reduced function of that gene that really make normal globin. And it was the transfer of that natural variation from those people to people with the disease that is currently being practiced. So, yes, you're exactly right. This is moving natural variants from one person to another. And is this, I mean, how optimistic can we let ourselves be about, you know, the fight against cancer and the dramatic side or even just like allergies, hay fever on the less dramatic side? Are, are we going to be able to wipe these out someday? I know the predicting timescales is always hard, but is that a realistic target? So I can tell you what's going to happen in the next five to 10 years. Okay. And at that point, we, we completely fall off the cliff of Yogi Berra. You know, it's, it's hard to make predi predictions, especially about the future. Yeah. And the reason I say this is, if, you know, if the, if, the, if the history of science and biology, my field, over the past three decades teaches us anything, is never underestimate the remarkable things that scientists can discover that Mother Nature gives us. <laughs> you know, if you, if you had told me 10 years ago, when we were doing gene editing with first-generation tools, 
that there is a scientist at Berkeley who will discover a molecular machine that will comes from bacteria that will use RNA to find a, its way to human genes and it will cure sickle cell disease. I would I would um, uh, probably ask ask for you to get some help with your, help with your mental health. Right. Um, and I would be egregiously wrong because that's exactly what happened. So super hard to extrapolate beyond 10 years because we don't know what technologies will, will, will show up. But here's what's going to happen in the next five to 10. There absolutely will be dramatic advances in the treatment of certain forms of cancer using this approach. So certain previously incurable cancers are now curable. Um, a lot of people are working on the application of gene editing of the human immune system to eradicate more challenging cancers. There's early stage progress. A lot of work remains, but I am completely convinced that the next five to 10 years, we'll see more cures. And I know cure is a big word. Um, the other one is certain forms of genetic disease. So the particular ones that I'm thinking about are sickle cell disease, which is remarkable. There is 100,000 Americans suffering from it. It's a terrible disease. Mm. Hemophilia, uh, you know, one in one in five to 10,000 uh, boys born uh, in, in, in the United States, for example, have hemophilia disorder and blood clotting. I think those two we can we can realistically expect for the public health burden of those diseases uh, and on the folks who have the disease will be dramatically reduced. I think my other biggest uh, area of excitement for this technology is actually in the treatment of pain. Um, oh, okay. So there are, there, are, there are forms of, you know, as the, the tragedy of the fact that tens and tens of thousands of our fellow Americans have died um, due to overdoses from um, uh, synthetic painkillers is these things are addictive. They're very powerful, but they're very addictive. So you so you get prescribed something um, um, for pain, and you know you get addicted to it, and you die of that, which is like such a tragedy. So um, the, the 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 worst offender is this thing called fentanyl, uh -huh. which really really kills. Why does fentanyl exist? Well, fentanyl exists because there are certain forms of pain that don't respond to morphine, like cancer pain. If you have cancer and if you have a met metastasis, um, I'm not a physician, but I've I've worked with physicians for 25 years, so I. I, I, I try to carefully reproduce what I learned from them. <laughs> there are certain forms of cancer pain. They're called breakthrough cancer pain for which there's no, no conventional um, um, o -O opiate would help. And so there are synthetics such as fentanyl, which you give to, uh, to folks with terminal cancer so that at least they can die in dignity rather than succumb to horrific pain. So we don't need that thing to exist. We now know, uh, thanks to some remarkable discoveries by geneticists, that there is a gene it's kind of astonishing. There is, and now we know two genes, and if you get rid of it, people feel no pain. Now that's a bad thing, right? We you need to feel pain. Um, Some pain, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, when you've cut yourself, you're in danger, or you know, there are many reasons why pain sensation is good. But when you're when you have terminal cancer and you have horrific pain, you don't need pain. And so it turns out that there are people who don't have that gene; they don't feel pain. And then there's a a different group of people that are more rare. Um, they are. They don't just feel pain. They're naturally high, so they're they're con constantly in a good mood. And so, one of the one of these genetic changes is in a system that transmits pain from your fingertip, for example, or your toe you stubbed through the spine to the brain. And the other uh, genetic system is uh, the so-called endocannabinoid system. It's a uh, it's Mother Nature's natural painkillers uh, that we uh, Mother Nature uses to get ourselves high. In, in just the right way. And so it turns out that we can use gene editing to get rid of either one of the systems or the other. And there are in fact, early stage efforts to try to make that into a therapeutic. And so in just very realistic terms, do I see this entering the clinic in the next three to five years? Absolutely. Do I see this having as having a strong potential for becoming a non-opioid, non-addictive way to treat certain forms of chronic pain? I absolutely do. Hmm. And then the last, um, which again, you know, 10 years ago, I would have probably suggested you get a reality check. But today, this is this is this is how fast things are moving. I think there are certain forms of common disease for which I really see a major promise for gene editing. And I say this because of some recent remarkable discoveries about uh, natural protection for heart disease. And if there's a theme emerging, I talked about people who were resistant to HIV. I spoke to you about people who don't feel pain. I'm now going to share information about people who never get heart attacks. And, you know, I, I have a family history of cardiovascular disease, so I would love to have that form of that gene, but unfortunately I don't. The gene has one of those jaw-breaking names that mean really nothing to lay people. It's called PCSK9. 
But it turns out that those rare individuals who don't have a normal copy, they seem to be fine, except they don't get heart attacks. Well, it's an exaggeration, of course, but their risk for heart attack is just vanishingly low. Okay. Okay. So, you know, what are we going to do with that? Yeah. Ask Mother Nature for a different gene? No. We ask gene editors to get rid of it. And in fact, there are active efforts and clinical trials could start as early as 2022 to take people with a severe risk for cardiovascular disease, in particular for heart attacks, and just get rid of this gene prospectively before they die of a heart attack. So, you know, in brass tax terms, you, you ask me, well, what are we looking forward to? I'm looking forward to a fundamentally new way to treat cancer, a fundamentally new way to approach genetic disease, because, of course, we can repair mutations, things like hemophilia or sickle cell disease. Um, I'm excited, hugely excited about pain, uh, not experiencing it, but getting rid of it. <laughs> and um, I'm really excited about certain common diseases, in particular cardiovascular disease. Beyond so, that, you yeah, know, I mean, let's let's uh, just go all the way and try to cure aging while we're at it, right? Well, okay, so this is where I'm going to be Debbie Downer, or I suppose not Debbie Downer, but, you know, the, the classic saying is that pessimist is a well-informed optimist. Uh. Aging is not a disease. The Food and Drug Administration and the European Medicines Agency and the Therapeutics Good Administration um, in um, uh, the United States and Europe and in uh, Australia and Health Canada in Canada do not recognize aging as a disease. <laughs> And uh, this is for a good reason. And you cannot, by definition, begin a clinical trial for a disease that doesn't exist. Okay. So uh, the other problem with doing uh, clinical trials for longevity is these trials take a while. Like imagine you had the, so there is a well-studied variant of a gene called IGF. It doesn't matter what that stands for. And folks with certain variants of it consistently live longer. They have a, they don't just live longer. They have a longer health span, which is kind of amazing. Whoa, longer health span. So now imagine a gene editing trial where, you know, uh, the scientists at the Innovative Genomics Institute at the University of California, Berkeley, have found a way to crank up the longevity gene. And there we are with our with our frantic look in our eyes in our lab coats uh, about to inject somebody with longevity juice. And then, of course, we wait 45 years to see if they live longer. You realize I'm being deliberately sarcastic because it's actually super hard. Yeah. yeah this is super hard to do. So well, in but, practical but, terms, what I go ahead, please. I mean, you're, this is the difference, right? Because I'm a sci I'm a physicist who thinks about uh, the cosmological lifespan of the universe, and you're someone who actually has the capability of affecting things in real ways over five year timescales. So if something takes a century timescale, you're like, yeah, let's not think about it. But I want to think about that. I mean, is is uh, in a few generations, could we have little molecular machines running around inside of us, uh, curing uh, or patching us up as we get tiny little dings on our DNA and, and therefore not maybe making us immortal, but extending our lifespan by quite a bit? First of all, I love the fact, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's such an affecting moment for me. You know, the universe is, what, 13.4 billion years old, something like that? 0.8, yep. Um, <laughs> yeah, I love the fact that you guys know that to, like, the fraction <laughs> of a decimal. That's just hysterical. For me, you know, 13.7 billion versus 13.9, yeah. 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 <laughs> and here I am stuck with the fact that something takes six months versus a year. So I love the fact that, the you know, we you, uh, the non-physicists think of the... Think of the of the world as on our Newtonian scale, you know, of sort of meet, meters and centimeters, and you think yeah. in angstrom or sub sub angstrom, and we think in years, and you think in, in billions of years. That's, I love that. That's amazing. Um, so, in practical terms, the way this is actually going to proceed is uh, we need uh, molecular machines that crank up the body's defenses against damage, and that's imaginable. That's in fact not science fiction. So, yes, I do envisage a future, for example, and this is, again, I want to be very careful because the world has enough uh, 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 novels on Amazon that describe maniacal science <laughs> and engineering and Gattaca-like futures. So I do imagine a future where humans acquire a molecular machine in their liver that helps the liver tolerate the many perform the many functions that it does. And, you know, the liver is a primary organ for detoxification. Right. And um, I absolutely see that. The other um, the, the other organ that I think is of huge, huge interest, and you will say the brain. No, in fact, it's not the brain. It's the kidney. So chronic kidney disease, you know, 30 plus million Americans have it. 
you know, the Medicare spends more money on uh, dialysis for that condition than mm. the National Institute of Health spends a year on its research budget. So it's a huge public health burden and it's a tragedy for folks who have it. Do I see a future where we engineer ways to make human kidneys carry some form of a machine that protects it against chronic kidney disease? Yes, I do. So um, I think the same could be true for the heart. Do I see a future where we either genetic, where we sort of, we place inside the human heart a molecular entity that uh, is wired? I don't want to say, like, I, I don't see a future where we have a myocardial infarction and the, the infarct is repaired immediately, but I absolutely see a future where the heart carries now a molecular machine where when there is a heart attack, if the person who had it survives it, that um, uh, the, the heart heals faster. I absolutely, that, that mm. is not, in, in other words, all the bits and pieces exist. You know, it's a little bit like living on Mars, right? I mean, can we live on Mars? I mean, yeah, we have to, first of all, get there safely. Then we have to build a <laughs> habitat. And then we have to find people who actually want to do this. But like kind of all the bits and pieces are in principle there. You just have to put them together. So when I'm describing all of these things, it's a little bit like, you know, the concept of creating a habitat on Mars. All the pieces are there. It's just right. going to take us time to get there. How much of uh, what we've been talking about is th there's this divide between um, epigenetic editing and germline editing, which I, I suspect is very, very important. And maybe you're a better person than me to explain what the difference is. Oh, my goodness. I hope your <laughs> podcast is five hours long. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> So let's do germline first. Very simple. It's 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 a, one of those things where things are as binary as it gets. Germline editing of human beings should never be allowed under any circumstances. Period. Mm. End of paragraph. It's scientists don't like you to use the word never, but this is one of those. What is germline editing? It's gene editing or other genetic engineering that can be passed on to future generations. There is no unmet medical need for it. Um, the, the public health burden of genetic disease that um, exists and is quite substantial can be and is being addressed by other means which are safe and ethical. Uh, germline editing is unethical and in fact illegal and useless for that purpose. The only potential uh, reason why people would want to do the germline editing is uh, to for human enhancement. And the reason that is should be forever banned is we don't know how to enhance people. And uh, imagine a setting, the, the classic example is we know of a gene um, getting rid of which will somewhat protect you from Alzheimer's. It's called APOE4. If you happen to have APOE4, and if you get rid of it, your risk of Alzheimer's will, will be dramatically reduced. So now imagine we, we, you know, we, we fertilize an embryo, and a human embryo, and then we no, get rid of that gene, and then we wait 18 years to see whether that child became an adult and then became an elderly human and is in fact protected against Alzheimer's. There is no way to do this. There's mm. just no mechanical, mechanical way. Um, by mechanical, I mean just the way the physical world works. And I shouldn't probably say in your presence physical. Um, <laughs> That's okay. Uh, yeah, it makes sense. Society. <laughs> the, 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 as, as I've learned through through years of reading and marveling at a layperson's books about theoretical physics, your world is getting more, in the words of Alice in Wonderland, curiouser and curiouser exactly. with every minute. It is. You're not minute. wrong. Yep. So um, I think that... Germline editing is just a non-starter, is fortunately illegal. Uh, well, it's not illegal. It's just not allowed in the United States. It's, it's, it, sh it, sh it should be banned forever. So now, epigenetic editing. Oh, goodness. Um, I think you should start a timer because I, I might just rant on and on. <laughs> but what ep epigenetics? Epigenetics is a change in the way an organism looks without a change in their DNA. And... Um, this is basically an epigenetic mark is basically molecular makeup, you know, literally like lipstick or or mascara that human DNA wears to try to instruct it what to do. So the genetic code specifies what the genes say. Epigenetics specify whether they say it and how they say it and when. Right. 
So a prime example of epigenetics gone wrong are neural tube defects in newborns. I'm sure you've heard and your audience has heard of spina bifida. Mm -hmm. So that's not a genetic error. It's an epigenetic error. And it has to do with how the neural tube develops and how during development of that neural tube, the genes acquire these epigenetic marks. So not changes in the DNA, but in this molecular makeup. And um, if the changes are placed incorrectly, perhaps because mom's diet was deficient in folate, and folate is a vitamin that provides an essential biochemical piece to the epigenetic machinery. So if mom doesn't get enough folate in her diet, then the epigenome, here's a pretty word, not genome, the epigenome is the collection of epigenetic marks that her baby's dna is acquiring that her baby's epigenome will be wrong and that baby's at risk for getting spina bifida which is why folate supplementation is a major success of public health for prevention of neural tube defects so scientists and physicians have learned that if you supplement the diet of a woman who would like to become pregnant and uh, of a woman who is pregnant, then she can choose to supplement her diet with folate both before becoming pregnant and while carrying the baby. And that will substantially reduce, although not completely eliminate, unfortunately, the risk of her um, becoming uh, d delivering a child with spina bifida. Although, full disclosure, I, just, I want to be very, very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? I want to be very respectful, uh, as all people in my field, of the fact that there ultimately what we do is about folks with the conditions, with the disability, and their rights, their interests, their feelings uh, are, I don't want to, sacred is a very strong word, but they kind of are. Yeah, and put so them I, first, I, primary. Uh, right, and I, so I, I want to be very careful here. I, you know, um, I'm sure uh, there, there are, we are trying to reduce the prevalence of, of, of this um, medical sim, um, uh, condition while being enormously uh, respectful and supportive and caring for the folks who have these conditions, right? I mean, right. you know, it's, there's that, that is what drives all, all that we do. Having said that, folate supplementation, if a woman chooses to take it, will reduce the risk of that woman having a child with a neural tube defect. Why? Because of an epigenetic effect. So believe it or not, Re recent developments have created not just gene editing, which is, you know, you change the sequence of DNA by either repairing a mutation or getting rid of a gene or adding a gene. You can also do epigenome editing. What does that mean? You don't change the genes, you just change what the genes do. And that, as it turns out, can have real benefits in some settings. So, for example, you can tune the duration of the effect, where, you know, a genetic change is like diamonds, it's forever. An epigenetic change does not have to be forever. You can dial it in to last for a couple of months for some reason. Hmm. And if not, it goes away. And I wouldn't be saying this to you if you're a humble servant together with some colleagues at the University of California, San Francisco, Carnegie Mellon and the Whitehead, wasn't working on a project funded by DARPA to create such an epigenetic change using CRISPR uh, in America's war fighters to protect them from radiation damage in the theater of war, in America's first responders, to protect them uh, for when they have to rush to the scene of either uh, potentially a nuclear accident or a dirty bomb scenario, and also to protect um, folks in the United States who are about to undergo um, radiation treatment for their abdominal or pelvic cancers. In all these cases, we are engineering a CRISPR, which we hope will create for a few weeks an epigenetic edit to protect the bone marrow and the gut of these individuals, whether the warfighter, the first responder, or the patient in a radiation oncology ward for just a month or so from the da danger of radiation poisoning. So this is a scenario where an epigenetic edit is preferable to a genetic one. Well, I want to dig into why it's preferable. I mean, if you could uh, do the same thing, but make these soldiers stronger and more resistant to bullets as well as radiation, uh, and why not make it last a long time? I mean, I'm, I'm asking leading questions because I think these are good issues and we shouldn't just uh, zoom over them. We should sort of sit down and think about what the issues are. 
So this is something that I myself and all our colleagues and the Department of Defense has thought hard about. Um, Amer you know, America's warfighters will stand up and defend her, whatever, whatever the, whatever the need. And right. so, but we have to be respectful of the fact that these women and men have committed their lives to that, and we have to be respectful of that, right? We we can, we cannot be, and I'm not suggesting you're saying that. I'm just saying we have to be respectful of their commitment to our country. Mm -hmm. And here, I think the Department of Defense wisely, and I concur with their judgment, has argued against making a permanent change because you know what. Um, that system for protecting us against damage has its benefits. You know, if a cell is too damaged, then, you know, it might die a normal death rather than survive and potentially acquire a cancerous change. Yeah. In an extreme setting where a, a, a war fighter who is in the special forces, the tip of the, of the spear, as, as the Department of Defense describes them, um, are, you know, are, are, have to be dropped from a helicopter into a regime change scenario where there is a nuclear fuel, and this is a realistic thing to contemplate, where that fuel can fall into the wrong hands. I mean, they're putting their lives on the line to, to save the world from disaster. That's one scenario, when we protect them for a, for a month a, against a harm that they can come in, in contact with. But when, they go, when, they, when they're honorably discharged or to, to leave the military, whatever, we want them to go back to lives pre-military so i would be I, I tell you i would be i would not agree right now to work on a gene edit program for um enhancing uh uh in, enhancements of that type i right. i just wouldn't um i epi edits sure but the idea that i would permanently genetically engineer a human being and thus commit them to having that dna for the rest of their lives and this was an enhancement type edit. I don't know, man. It's a. It, it's it, that will be a hard pill for me to swallow. Well, I'm very sympathetic to this idea that it's incredibly difficult to know what all the possible ramifications are were you to go down that road, right? Like even with the best of intentions, if you tried to make people, uh, you know, healthier or had better eyesight or whatever, or taller or bigger IQs, it could ruin other things that we have a difficult time. Uh, anticipating but I guess what I'm what I'm thinking of I'm, what I'm not doing is advocating it but I'm what I'm doing is guessing that someone's not going to feel that way someone's just going to do it right it's going to be done somewhere in the world it, this technology is becoming easier and easier to use right like are there going to be people in their garages uh, 3d printing CRISPR programs to make different babies absolutely and that's in fact already happening yeah uh, I think that the tragedy of Jen Kui He's alleged crime is that I don't want to swear on air, but like I'm, you can imagine I'm inserting words here, which your work, you know, la la language that I learned to use when I was drafted <laughs> at the age of 18, when I was drafted into the Soviet military. That I would have to flag on YouTube. I understand. <laughs> yeah, no, let's, but Jen Kui He is a criminal. This is the Chinese scientist who um, who actually did this to human babies, right? For to, to prevent... Alleged, allegedly, allegedly. Allegedly, yeah. Okay. So he performed two crimes. The first crime is he irreversibly stained my field hmm. of genetic engineering to treat disease with a with a with a imprint of designer baby. Yeah. You know, you tell people I do CRISPR, people say, "Oh, do you make babies? Do you make smarter babies?" Yeah. No, we don't. We try to cure cancer and sickle cell disease. But, yeah. but the other thing that's even a deeper crime is he showed to the rogues of the world that this can be done. I am absolutely convinced that there are laboratories right now, they're underground. I mean, I don't mean physically, I mean metaphorically, yeah. who, are, who are enhancing, quote unquote, embryos for people with too much money, too much money and not enough understanding of the science and not enough ethics. Um, that's happening. And I think that I don't think there is any way to prevent that from happening, because um, again, this is why Jennifer Doudna's discovery of how CRISPR works is, I mean, revolution is not is not enough of a word. It, it puts it, it put us in a different world. Right. You know, um, it, I'm I, it, you know, as a scientist, I would say phase transition, but that's that's a good way to p put people to sleep. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I think me, I know. Well, maybe, maybe you know imagine metamorphosis where you have a crawling caterpillar and suddenly you, you have a flying butterfly so jennifer's discovery 
converted my world from a crawling uh, crawling caterpillar to a flying butterfly. It's just like we yeah. were moving in a fundamentally different way. We have flight. Thank you very much. Um, so um, it's 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 actually high school biology easy. So are will there be and are there uh, people who don't understand the literature and who are delusional doing that right now to themselves and potentially human embryos? There are. Here's what to do about this. First, embryo and baby editing has to be a crime everywhere to ensure that 100% of the time that somebody is outed, somebody running, you know, 1-800-design-your-babies-genes.com, yeah. every time these people are outed, they go to jail. Period. End of paragraph. Separately, and that cannot eradicate that because CRISPR is too technologically straightforward. Like, you know, I don't know anything about nuclear reactors, but I suspect that building one requires a certain amount of know-how. Yes. And you have to have the infrastructure and you have to buy the stuff. So that's not true for CRISPR. The know-how is relatively modest and you can buy the stuff. And you can buy the stuff sort of sotto voce. You don't have to tell the world, oh my God, I'm doing CRISPR and my baby. So that has to be driven into as low a prevalence as possible by making it completely illegal. Human somatic enhancement of consenting adults well, let me give you an example. Botox is legal for wrinkles. Mm -hmm. Botox is botulinum toxin, is one of the most dangerous substances on earth by weight. The Food and Drug Administration has approved a situation where people who don't like wrinkles inject themselves with Botox. So do I see a future where there's CRISPR ox? I hope it's not called that. <laughs> that people inject into themselves to get rid of wrinkles or whatever, change their eye color. I don't care. As long as consenting adults apply to themselves things that have passed regulatory review by the FDA, by Health Canada, by the EMA, I'm totally fine. But the key issue here is consent. Right. As long as a human being with eyes open agrees, then I see no reason difference. Frankly, you know, people get tattoos all the time and then getting rid of them is a lot harder. Um, people need to understand that a gene edit cannot be eliminated and that they will live with the consequences of that for the rest of their lives. But at the end of the day, it will come down to free will. If it's legal for somebody to obtain a piercing in a body part where most people would rather not put a needle, it's perfectly fine for people to create a double strand break in their DNA using a, a, a procedure that is safe and permanently genetically modify them. So we should uh, maybe shift our focus from designer babies to designer grown-ups. There will be designer grown-ups, for sure. Yeah. There's no, no question in my mind. And the only thing that needs to happen for that is a few years need to pass for the FDA to grow comfortable with a safety and efficacy record of gene editing for treating disease. And, you know, the classic example I'll give you is statins. Statins were, you know, everybody takes statins if they're at risk of cardiovascular disease, but they were not initially developed for prevention. They were approved for the treatment of rare forms of heart disease. And when it was seen that they're safe, you know, they're now over-the-counter statins, or I think they're about to be. Um, so the same thing will happen with gene editing. Once we know that it's safe and effective to treat disease, somebody will show up and say, ooh, you know, I'll give you an example. If you get rid of a gene called the androgen receptor, and it's on the X chromosome, and we know where it is. I know we, I can tell you everything about it. If you get rid of that gene, you will get rid of baldness. So you can put CRISPR in shampoo. Can mm. you imagine? Yes. The, the, comp the company that <laughs> builds that, I'm sad to say, will be more will be more expensive than Apple and Google. Yeah. Because you know the, the amount of money that people will spend on their vanity, as, ex as experience has shown, is pretty insane. So yeah, that I totally see a setting where there is a shampoo. I'm, I'm not. I'm, I, I want to emphasize. I, I, I am. I haven't had any stimulants other than coffee today. <laughs> um, so do I see a future where there is a CRISPR-like molecule formulated in a special age, in a special uh, 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 chemical formula to allow penetration of the scalp and editing the androgen receptor gene in uh, the, the stem cell uh, at, the, at, the, at the bottom, at the root of each hair follicle, and thus prevent a male pattern baldness? Absolutely. That, this will happen. This will happen. Well, I always like to say that I like to end the podcast on an optimistic note, and that's certainly one. But just in case there's another optimistic note out there, um, do, do you have some final words about how this all relates back to uh, the pandemic and our, our current urge to shield ourselves from this nasty little virus that's running around? I do. I think that 
real world solutions require many different subunits and they don't emerge from the same field. So for example, my, my favorite example is that uh, the space suit that Neil Armstrong walked the moon in was not made by one giant contractor. It was made by Playtex. Yeah. Seamstresses at Playtex sewed the spacesuit. So in 1969, I think, is when the moonshot was, this marvel of technology, the rocket, the telemetry, the fuel, the engine, blah, 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 and the spacesuit was sewn by seamstresses at Playtex. Similarly, the real-world impact of any technology such as CRISPR on anything such as the pandemic requires multiple technologies and other things to converge in real. People have to wear masks. But I think we have entered two separate ages in medicine. The first one is we have entered the age of the genetically engineered human. That is irreversible. There are now approved medicines for cancer and for genetic disease where people get genetically engineered. This will only rise. And over the next decade or two, the public health burden of genetic diseases and infectious diseases and cancer will start to be lower in, in, in the developed world where there is access to treatments of that type. Uh, but we have also entered the age where we don't just read human DNA. We understand what human DNA says. And we're doing this at a pace that was uh, what was unimaginable before. And critically, these discoveries are translated into therapeutics or ways to prevent disease much faster than anyone thought possible. It used to take 15 years. These days, it takes two. Two years ago, Regeneron discovered a gene that protects from a non-alcoholic theater hepatitis, which is a severe disease of the liver. Two years later, they're in the clinic, they're in the clinic with, a, with a medicine, RNAi, that targets that gene. It's unimaginable that two years, or only two years pass. So as far as the pandemic is concerned, for these viruses or other viruses, I'm actually excited about the prospect of genetic engineering of humans to genetically vaccinate them for viral infections. Now, frankly, where I'd like to go first with this is into the developing world, into parts of Africa and Asia, where there's not enough access to HIV medication, to use gene editing to genetically vaccinate folks at risk hmm. for HIV against it preemptively. I think that, that that would be, I mean, obviously this would have to pass regulatory review and would have to, you know, talk past the highest rigor of ethics in terms of informed consent, et cetera. But I think, do I see a future where we engineer preemptively gene edits or epigene edits as this year's vaccine for SARS-CoV-7 to prevent us, protect us from COVID-2026, uh, COVID which there will be COVID-2026, as we all know, it's not mm -hmm. just COVID-19. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have entered we have entered a very formidable space where the technologies have now converged, where genetic engineering or epigenetic engineering of people is a clinical reality, and it's just going to grow in scope. It really does make make me feel like the state of gene editing in 2020 is sort of like or making predictions about its future. It's like trying to predict the future of the personal computer in the early 1980s, right? Like there was clearly something going on and you could see that things would happen, but it's probably the unanticipatable consequences that will end up being the ones that will really change things down the road. I could not agree with you more. And, uh, you know, Sidney Brenner, one of my scientific idols and Nobel laureate and one of the founders of modern experimental biology, said progress in science uh, comes from uh, new technologies and new discoveries and new ideas, probably in that order, which is a stunning thing to say, because he was the father of so many ideas that changed the world. But we live in a we are in a technology driven space. I completely agree with you. Uh, I'm not a computer person, but, you know, clearly miniaturization, right? the transition from I'm old enough to remember floppy disks. It's impossible to explain to my 21-year-old <laughs> daughter what a floppy disk is. Yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> uh, and so I do I anticipate exactly as you said that progress in human genetic and epigenetic engineering in the clinic and for disease protection and potential enhancement will be as unpredictably exciting as what's happened from the good old, you know, IBM PC AT in 1986 or whatever. Absolutely. That's that is exactly what will happen. So I guess we, we just buckle our seatbelts and, and either either make this happen or 
or make use of what, what's happening. So it, yeah, it, well, we appreciate very much you uh, helping us to buckle our seatbelts here. I think it's going to be a wild ride. Fyodor Orno, <laughs> thanks so much for being on the Mindscape podcast. Truly a pleasure.